American Coaster Enthusiast, I'm excited to be back to celebrate World Roller Coaster Appreciation Month with you for the second time. We are coming to you for a bit virtual. We'll be in person at some celebrations this year, but we can also celebrate from home. So today, I am here with Ron Gustafson, Director of Marketing and PR for Quasi Amusement Park. Now, how many of you have been to Quasi? I know I have, and I had a fantastic visit. So, and so you all know who I am. I am Elizabeth Ringus. I'm the Director of Communications for American Coaster Enthusiasts. And we're gonna chat with Ron today about Quasi and their amazing wooden roller coaster, Wooden Warrior. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, glad to be here, Elizabeth. Always fun to uh, chat with people who are interested in the industry and especially those with uh, roller coaster interests. <laughs> I say the same thing. Any chance I get to talk about roller coasters, I'm always game. <laughs> but it is fun when somebody's really passionate too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it makes all the difference. And you, as you probably know, you have to be passionate in our industry because <laughs> it's uh, always challenging. Uh, and the last uh, year and a half has been a lot more challenging. So it has. But here we are anyways. We, we survived it. <laughs> Good. And tell us a little bit about what that year and a half looked like for Quasi. Um, now, were y'all able to have guests in summer 2020, 2020? Have you, what's it looked like at the park? Well, we, you know, always open in late April. Uh, last year, because of COVID, we were held off until June 20 to open. And so when it's abbreviated season to begin with, and then we were under a capacity cap of 33%. Um, so there were no group functions. Um, you know, day traffic was okay. But, you know, if you came to the park on what would have looked like a busy day, you know, bottom line was we were able to keep the lights on uh, and a lot more fortunate than some parks that couldn't even open last year, especially, you know, family-owned parks such as ourselves. We've got friends uh, across the, the country who are – family operators and uh, some of them took a more dramatic hit than we did. So it was a difficult time. And so I'm sure y'all are counting the days till you are ready to welcome guests for 2021. When is opening day? Well, actually our opening day came off without a hitch this year, first weekend of April. Um, we did two weekends called uh, Neighbors in Need, part of our Quasi Care uh, program and uh, we were overwhelmed, <laughs> to say the least, which was a good thing because we did a food drive, a dog food drive, a personal care item drive to support a number of uh, local beneficiaries. And we also support what's called the Greater Waterbury Campership Fund to help send uh, underprivileged kids to camp. So, you know, the floodgates were opened. Um, the capacity limits were um set aside at opening and now we're just waiting for further um, statements from the state of Connecticut in regard to social distancing and face masks and it looks like uh, by later this month in May um, some of the face mask uh, mandates for outdoor activities will be lifted so we think day traffic will be much better this year at the park we've already, already seen an indication of that uh, group business is still going to be touch and go because so many schools and other functions that have to come on buses, that still uh, probably looks like next year. And, you know, some of the corporate outings uh, we deal with, they're a little bit hesitant as well. I can see that. It's, it's treading through how do we sort out this new, new normal, right? And what does that look like? But Wow, but once you talked about what good you're doing for the community, truly embraces what I think of when I think of Quasi is that y'all are a treasure. You're a small family park um, and you're in Middlebury, Connecticut, right? For those who don't know. And y'all started as a trolley park. Um, that's one of the yeah. few that's still in operation today. And am I correct that y'all have the third generation of the family operating the park that's owned it since 1937? Yeah, uh, actually, we're into our fourth generation now um, with some of the, you know, the younger family members stepping up to the plate. So, 
you know, that's great. And, and yeah, we're one of a handful of, quote, trolley parks left. Uh, there's less than a dozen. And if you don't know what a trolley park is or was, uh, those are amusement parks that were owned and operated by electrified rail lines uh, back in the early part of the uh, 20th century, which would be the early 1900s. And the rail lines built amusement parks at the end of their lines, so they'd have weekend traffic because they were busy in the cities during the weekdays taking people to and from work, taking shoppers around town. So at the end of the week, when uh, no one was going to work on the weekends except the store people, um, trolley lines said we could make some extra, extra money by having amusement parks uh, at the end of our line or just outside of town. So there were more than a thousand of these parks before the Great Depression. And today we're down to, I think, 11 right now. And Quasi is one of them. Only one is west of the Mississippi, and that's Oaks hmm. out in Portland, Oregon. That is a huge change for the industry and what it means for an amusement park. But what a fascinating origin for your park and what drove it. That's just um, so exciting to see that bringing people out for the weekend concept. Um, you know, what? it's what we see in marketing today is how do you make sure that you have a full business lineup from weekday to weekend? Um, and they truly embraced it in the early 1900s. And I'm glad y'all have been able to hold on through all this and um, but you all have seen a lot of um, change through the years, obviously coming from being a trolley park so early, but you had your biggest um, reinvigoration project that kicked off in 2002 and we built the new water park. Yeah. yeah, that was the beginning of uh, what Quasi is today. And that's when I, I walked into the park on Labor Day 2002 uh, and took this position. So I actually started work that day and the owners had laid out their future plans to me because had I not had an inkling of what was going to happen the next couple of decades, uh, I still would have probably been a newspaper editor <laughs> instead of a marketing director at an amusement park. But um, yeah, they put it all on the line back in 2002 when they said they were going to build saturation station, which is a huge interactive water play area. Um, and that's, that's the stage for everything that's happened ever since the, the water play area was a huge hit in 2003. It brought new life to the lakefront at Quasi because we do set on a, a natural lake up there in Northwestern Connecticut. And thanks to that cash flow started to increase and we we're able to do new rides in the park then go back to the water park, add some features there. And that's been the progression ever since 2002 until today. So again, having that vision uh, that the park owners did, uh, Eric Anderson especially, back in 2002, um, has led the park to survive. And our patriarch owner, John Francis, his father bought the park in 1937. He says uh, the water park saved the park. And he's probably right. Wow. Well, in 2008, y'all took on the biggest adventure that I know our members were most excited about. And that's when the new roller coaster came to the park. Um, that coaster we all now know and love as Wooden Warrior. But this wasn't an easy endeavor, was it? No, you know, we announced the project. Um, our centennial was 2008. We wanted to have a roller coaster for the centennial. Of course, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, um, once we got around to officially announcing um, that year, we knew what was going to happen, that we were going to try to build a roller coaster for perhaps the following year. And the next thing you know, uh, one of the neighbors filed a lawsuit against the park and the town of Middlebury, and it actually held the project up for a year. So we didn't break ground on Wooden Warrior until August of 2010. And... Um, I was there, you know, for that when uh, the first scoops of dirt came out with a backhoe <laughs> and uh, the project did open on time. We opened April on opening day the following year, 2011. The mighty timbers of the forest have been transformed this year into something powerful and majestic, a mammoth creation destined to become a legend by all who encounter it. 
Bear witness to the Wooden Warrior, a new family roller coaster like never before, only at Quasi Amusement Park in Middlebury, Connecticut. Fear not this daunting marvel, for man has created it for pure fun. Soar like the eagle with the wind at your face. The Wooden Warrior at Quasi Amusement Park. That is amazing um, for your small park and this great coaster. Now y'all chose Gravity Group to build the coaster. Did you take proposals from other companies also and then make your um, selection from them or was it just you loved Gravity Group? No, we had at least a half a dozen proposals on the table. Uh, you know, another wooden coaster, um, some steel coasters, uh, Fred Myler you know, makes coasters uh, out in Oregon. Uh, he had a, a plan with us and a couple from overseas. And actually, Wooden Warrior is the second proposal that um, the Gravity Group presented. Um, we liked the first plan they came up with. And when it went before the town board, it turned out it was about 60 feet too close to the highway. So Gravity Group uh, reconfigured it and came up with what is today the warrior and after seeing the two coasters the you know the uh preliminary artwork on both of them and taking the virtual ride on both of them um before it was even released to the public warrior is the best of the two uh that gravity group came up with ah so it was all meant to be huh <laughs> you, yeah. got the, you got the better coaster and you mentioned you were there when that first scoop of dirt came out and were there through the process. What was that like for you to be part of such a momentous occasion for the future of the park? Well, I think everybody was excited. Uh, I know we were, you know, as far as management and the owners, because uh, it had been such a long drawn out process to, to clear the hoops. Number one, to, um, you know, get the authorization from the town to do it and settled all the issues with um, the litigation. Um, and it turned out to be, the at the, that point, the largest single investment in the park's history. So again, a lot was on the line, and everybody was saying, how great a ride is it going to be? How great a ride is it going to be? And anybody that knows roller coasters, unless it's a cookie-cutter steel coaster, you don't know until you take that first ride. Um, and as Eric Anderson our park president and one of our owners said, uh, we took those first rides um, that week before it opened. And Eric's vision was, we're going to build a roller coaster that children can ride uh, with the rest of the family. And he got off after the first ride and he says, I'm updating my statement to say a brave young child can ride with this, the rest of the family. So, uh, and I remember the first, uh, couple rides we did we had some ace people there and as it turned into the brake line i heard somebody shout up to me one of the ace people ron you've got a winner so <clears throat> it's been uh it's been uh, great ever since it has y'all definitely built a winner and that has been um true time and time again each year Wooden Warrior is consistently recognized in the top 50 of wooden coasters, despite its small but mighty size. What do you think stands out to riders that makes them know it's such a winner? Well, you know, the, I think the thing that really plays into it is we were the first in all of North America to run a Timberliner train um, from the Gravity Craft, which is a sister company of the Gravity Group. And I tell everybody who hasn't seen this uh, train before I said the thing corners like a race car and it does it, it doesn't beat up the track and thanks to its configuration it's just uh, two seats side by side and then it's the next section of the train it's not a long boxy you know for four person car and then another car so that really helps in maneuvering uh, around the track and not beating it up because it's it's not being forced to make the turns in the um and especially the fast turns that Warrior has. Uh, and it's surprising in that I remember maybe it was two years ago, I said something to Eric about, you know, how's the track holding up? And he said, Ron, to date, we've only replaced one track bolt on this ride, um, which is amazing if you know anything about maintaining a wooden roller coaster. Um, and it, 
again, it reverts back to the timber liner train. Uh, it's smoothness. It's, it's not fighting to run the course. And, um, you know, it's just a great ride. Thanks to that a lot faster than a lot of people think. Um, we had some folks, uh, ride it recently from one of our rock radio stations up here. They did uh, roller coaster karaoke <laughs> and they were trying to sing some songs while they were riding wooden warrior. And I remember one of the, uh, news people got on there and she screamed halfway around. And when she got off, she says, I didn't realize it was going to be that fast. <laughs> so anybody that's ridden it knows it's, it, it screams for a small coaster of only 1,250 feet in track, track length. Um, and again, we've only got about 40 foot drop with the topography there, but, um, it set the stage for the gravity group to build more of these quote family size roller coasters, um, you know, in the nation and, and over in Europe. So wooden warrior was the, it really set the stage for them. We believe. And that's such an important spot in an amusement park also to give children that opportunity, whether just your general child or your extra thrilled child having to be extra brave. That's such an important niche to give them that opportunity to make that memory with their family, first of all, to get to ride together, but also to give them that step up coaster so that they are continuing to advance and find those thrills that are right for them. Um, I just think that's probably the most critical thing next to a kiddie coaster for an amusement park to have. Um, I know it always stands out in my memory of those early rides with my kids. Yeah. You know, the neat thing too is we, um, Gravity Group did an update on their lap bar system. So even younger children can ride Warrior today than they did when it opened 10 years ago. So we knocked another two inches off of that uh, minimum height requirement thanks to their uh, you know, innovation is the, the trains, more trains were produced. They found things they could tweak on the trains and we've kept right up with that process with them and updated uh, our timber liners as um, these updates have come out. So uh, even more children can ride it now than they could 10 years ago, just on the height requirement. Two inches is huge. That's amazing um, to have been able to drop it so far and let an even younger child ride and experience it. Yeah, and again, it's great. It's who and what we are, so everybody can try to do things as a family. Yes, that is, I mean, that's your part premise, right? Now, yeah. you talked a little bit about maintenance and how little maintenance y'all have had to do. What are your plans or what plan do you have in place as you think about what you'll need to do special touch-wise to focus and guarantee that it continues to offer such um, great rides and smooth rides that are really enjoyable for years to come. Well, I think, you know, anybody that's in the park business knows you have a ro rotating schedule in maintenance. You know, A, B, and C has to be done every year. If it's uh, uh, non-destructive testing on components of this ride or that ride, or the train has to be pull pulled off the coaster and go into the shop and totally torn down, which was done recently on, on the Timberliner. Um, and same with the water park attractions, you know, there's certain things that have to be done every year. And then you have a schedule where an entire ride goes back into the shop is sandblasted, repainted, um, bearings, everything are checked. So it's a continual rotation. And, um, you know, as far as the coaster itself, you know, that's inspected on a daily basis. When we operate, our guys have to walk the track in the morning, uh, look for anything that might need adjusted. But uh, so far, there's been really no track replacement, a couple boards here and there, uh, but 10 years in, in, in running. So the thing was built like a beast. I remember when it was going up, one of our mechanics looked at me and said, this is going to be here long after we're gone. It, it's built so strong. That's wonderful. You made a great investment with that. And it's good that maintenance has been low so that you're not having to reinvest and can focus on other parts of the park. Now, this is actually yeah. the fourth coaster that Quasi has operated. Can you tell us about the other three? Well, uh, the oldest coaster at the park is a 1952 Allen Herschel. And uh, the family bought that and three other Herschel rides in 52. And we think it's the first, quote, complete kitty land that Herschel produced, where actually there were three rides operating inside 
the, the circumference of the Little Dipper. Um, so that's been there uh, ever since. Uh, it's running great. It's uh, The cars went through our shop, I think it was last year, uh, came out like brand new. The Herschel Company is still in existence with ride service over in North Tonawanda, New York. So we're going to keep the Little Dipper running as long as it can. And, and um, like Ed over to the Herschel Company, I talked to him just uh, two weeks ago. He said, Ron, these rides were built. They're indestructible. Um, and, and Ed's right. Uh, we have, let's see how many other Herschel rides. One, two, three. We have three other Herschel rides still running in the park from that era. Um, so, you know, after the Herschel coaster went in, we had a, uh, uh, a wild mouse for a period of time in the sixties up by, uh, where now the big flush water coaster is right next to wooden warrior. And then in 83, we purchased from Rye Playland, some friends of ours down there, the Tolvi family had a Herschel monster mouse which was the biggest herschel steel coaster the company produced and that operated at the park until 2010 part of the agreement with the town was and we needed the space anyways once warrior opened uh, we would retire the herschel mouse which made more room for us at the lakefront to expand the water park uh, so that's a little bit of the history of the coasters and if you want to read the whole history of the coasters, you can go to our website and pull up our uh, anniversary magazine we published uh, in 2018. The whole whole lowdown is in there, so including some photos of those older rides. That's great. I love your um, focus on making sure that um, the rides are preserved, and you work hard to keep those nice traditional rides to keep. Because one thing I love about a roller coaster is coming back generations later, getting to ride it again and share that special moment and memory with the next generation. So I love that y'all are offering that. Now, in your career here, you get to do a lot for Quasi. But before you came to the park, you were already a Museum Park history buff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I worked at another property over in New York. Uh, Midway Park, which is now owned by the state of New York, unfortunately, but don't get me talking about amusement parks owned by the government. <laughs> uh, and they were really a model for the Allen Herschel Company because they were 70 miles from the Herschel plant. So they had a lot of the kiddie rides that Herschel built during that, uh, that era back in the 50s. And I was also ride supervisor over there. So I set up the rides in the spring, trained staff, uh, did all the PR for the property. And then when the fall came, I had to take the rides down and store them for the winter. So I knew these Herschel rides pretty much inside and out. And like Ed said, they were built to be pretty much non-destructible. And, and they are. They're, they're great rides. Um, and my wife and I even owned and operated our own rides for a period of time uh, years ago. So I've been involved in the business, uh, I'm pushing almost 50 years now, uh, between PR and an owner operator and, and everything else and, and writing for all the trade magazines and um, you wear a lot of hats <laughs> in the amusement park industry. You make pizza <laughs> when you have to, popcorn, hand out soft drinks. So, <laughs> You know, I feel like the industry is just like the enthusiasts because I love to talk about how enthusiasts come for the roller coasters, but end up finding so many other niches within it, whether it's researching history or doing photography. There's so many other small pieces that can just keep leading you in different directions for your passion. That sounds like that's what the industry yeah, right. is doing too. Yeah, and I am a historian, an industry historian. I've written hundreds and hundreds of articles um, on fascinating people in our business, uh, manufacturers, I was uh, chairman of the IAPA Hall of Fame committee uh, a few years back. I served on that committee more years than I can count. Um, so, yeah, I've, uh, uh, you know, volunteered in a lot, of, a lot of different aspects of our industry, and I still serve as our uh, volunteer here with the New England Association and do their newsletter. Uh, 
So still active on that side as well. Are you investigating or researching any history projects right now? Yeah, I just finished one. Um, I'm not at liberty to say because I was um, commissioned to do a project uh, with some other folks, and that'll probably be announced soon. I do have two history books that have been published, the history of Quasi Amusement Park and the history of Midway Park, where I worked, uh, two of the remaining trolley parks uh, in the nation. And I also wrote the first history of the Allen Herschel Company back in 1980. I actually had the privilege to interview Alan Herschel, the grandson of the founder of the company, Alan Herschel, um, and spent a lot of time in North Tonawanda going through uh, the archives and records there. And, and fortunately, the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum uh, opened up a few years later back in the 80s, and you can visit the museum and, and see some of the living history uh, of the Herschel Company. And if you remember Wurlitzer band organs at all, Herschel was um, responsible for bringing the band organ industry pretty much into the United States so he could have music on his carousel. So that's why uh, Wurlitzer was based just a mile or two down the street from the Allen Herschel Company years ago. Now that is an interesting fact for all our carousel enthusiasts, because we know that although we're roller coaster enthusiasts, we know we love amusement parks in general and treasure everything about them. Um, that is so exciting to hear all that you've done through um, preserving the history and making sure it's documented for generations to come. What, where did your passion for the amusement park industry begin? Uh, my passion began years ago because I grew up as a, a child only a few miles away from Midway Park. Um, so I was over there riding the kitty rides on Wednesdays when it was five cent day. <laughs> and uh, my real first taste of doing anything in the industry, I volunteered for what was considered then the largest fireman's carnival in the United States in Chautauqua County, New York. We had uh, around 20 volunteer fire companies got together and threw this huge carnival weekend uh, in July. So I did all the marketing and PR for them uh, on a volunteer basis. And when you have 20 fire companies come together for one event, you can imagine uh, the impact uh, that it had with parades and a queen contest and fireworks and the carnival. Um, and again, once you get a taste of it, if it gets in your blood, um, you know, you're all in at that point. You can't be half in or you know, just lukewarm to it because those people don't last in this business. It's all in or nothing. <laughs> so that that's really good advice and a great point to make because it does. It takes a lot out of you personally. Um, as ex as exciting as it is at times, it's also exhausting. I imagine. Um, but yeah. but one huge thing was the personal experience you got to have going through the opening of Wooden Warrior, and it was such um, an interesting project from the beginning. Y'all actually um, engaged the community right off the bat and engaged students to help name it. Yeah, correct. That was a, that was a real fun project. We, we did a name the roller coaster contest uh, in the region uh, with our schools and we had 92 entries uh, from middle schools and elementary schools. And of course, we had to do a lot of research online to make sure the entries weren't interfering with any registered trademarks or they were, you know, put aside automatically. And, um, you know, there were a few in there that were borderline, but it was surprising that two separate schools, two separate classes came up with the name Wooden Warrior. And um, they were both elementary classes. And I remember when we sat down at a, one of the meetings uh, to discuss the handful we had selected as finalists, we said it's a real fit for us because of the Native American heritage of the park. Um, we sit on Lake Quasipog, and for the years the park was known as Lake Quasipog Amusement Park, which is Native American for big pond or rock pond, the lake. Um, so Wooden Warrior really was an ideal fit, um, and it, again, relates back to the heritage of the property, and 
we just feel, you know, it was just like the light bulb went on and we saw that name. And here, two, two separate schools were kind of thinking along the same lines. So there was a lot of good names in there, and, and we're glad we were able to pick Warrior. We went to the two schools. George Francis, one of our owners, and I, we, we had T-shirts made up for the kids. It says, I named the Wooden Warrior. I think I sent you the photo, didn't I? Yeah. The one group photo, the one group of kids wearing the shirt. And um, so the, we went, did two school presentations, one at each school, of course. And then I went back to the uh, principals at the school, and I said, here's what we want to do. We want to get a laser engraved plaque and put it on the warrior naming all these kids every one of them so they had to get every parent to sign off which they did and then we uh, sent out and had this huge plaque made have you seen it this the stainless steel laser engraved plaque on the just as you walk up the steps to the platform that's where it is okay you know, uh, so that's I'm still sure there that's great and so it was a, you know, it was a real neat process of developing that, plus the TV commercial um, to launch Warrior. I think I sent you a copy of that, perhaps, a link to it. Um, and we did all the, you know, we, we wrote the script in-house and our uh, production companies up in Bristol, we worked closely with them. We were their first accountants, in fact, years and years ago. And we still work with those guys. And it was like when I presented the script to them, it was almost as if they sat there when I wrote it because they immediately got it. I didn't have to explain <laughs> a lot to them. This is what we want to do. If, you know, if you see the first scene with the, the big trees and everything um, and how that just engulfs you. And to this day, I hear more comments about that television commercial than any commercial uh, the park has ever produced. It's still uh is a heart throbber, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, there was there was a lot going on at that time, all about Wooden Warrior. It was it was a lot of fun for me in the PR side to be able to uh, to work on a project like that. It sounds like it was an amazing culmination of your passion for the industry really coming together and letting it shine and share it with the community, uh, because y'all truly do engage your community, um, and that is something that um, we can't always say about a park you truly embrace that local aspect um you're bringing something so special and making so many memories we are so excited to celebrate um wooden warrior this year for 10 years of thrilling rides and um all that it brings it's such a great thing we really appreciate you taking the time to share your stories and more about the park with us for world roller coaster appreciation month and um i hope everyone enjoys hearing more about it and checking out some of the videos that you mentioned that were um, definitely have been integrated into this. Okay, great, Elizabeth. And we're going to see a lot of our ACE friends, uh, I believe it's July. It was just announced this week by the New England uh, region of ACE, um, an event in July uh, with Kwasi and the Warriors. So I think they'll probably have the tickets for that available here pretty soon. Yes, you'll be able to check out aceonline.org if you want to see that and find out more information about attending that event. Um, it's aceonline.org backslash calendar. I mean, you can find all the details of the event right there, and we'd love for you to join us and come out and ride with Ace. <laughs>